this week's closing bell, markets are deep in the red as investors fret about long-term economic growth for America. They are afraid that higher interest rates will stifle growth, as people are less likely to spend if they have to borrow at such a high rate. On Friday, the Dow lost over 1,200 points and the S&P 500 and Nasdaq followed suit. No particular sector led losses, as worries about interest rates affect nearly every sector in the market. Even tech stocks, which have been rallying recently, declined as a result of this week's market sentiment. Getting more into the reason behind the mass selling, we look no further than the rising interest rates. With borrowing costs going up and the Fed's conservative goals for our budget, economic principles suggest that policymakers will be rising interest rates very soon to accommodate for the rise in prices. Another sign of slowed economic growth are the treasury yields. The longer term treasury yields showed a downward trajectory while the shorter term yields rose, a typical flattening of the curve. This is a clear sign for investors for an interest rate hike and slowed economic growth. Home prices around the world are showing most of the same signs they did before the 2008 housing bubble burst. Especially with everyone locked away in their homes during the pandemic, home buyers are looking to buy bigger and better homes, as more memories will be made there. Record low interest rates plus savings on taxes and additional stimulus checks are also in favor of bigger purchases. A recent report from Bloomberg Economics, New Zealand, Canada, and Sweden rank as the world's frothiest, closely followed by the US and the UK. This analysis is based on the ratio of house prices to rent or local salaries in that area. And they suggest that the crisis we are currently in is far worse than the 2008. However, Bloomberg still thinks that the market will slowly bleed as compared to a steep sell-off like we saw earlier. But looking at the bigger picture, this has a massive impact on banks as they hold a majority of the risk in the real estate market. Giving out the loans makes them the most to lose rather than the homeowners themselves. Learning from our cockroach theory last week, JP Morgan also recently came out saying that they anticipate a larger drop in trading revenue this quarter, suggesting bad things for the entire sector. Wise announced intentions to go public in the London Stock Exchange via direct listing. Direct listings are different from IPOs in that they share pre-existing private stock directly to the public. They don't raise any money through venture capital investment banks prior to listing. IPOs, on the other hand, sell part of the company to the public by floating them as shares. But a direct listing, again, entails of listing private shares directly to the public. No new shares are floated in this process. This move makes the most sense for veteran Wise, who is already an established company. He is responsible for $7 billion in transactions and has been profitable since 2017. In short, it's far from a startup that needs our money. Plus, by taking this route, it cuts out investment banks and the exorbitant fees that come with making an IPO. However, due to this direct listing, we won't know the valuation of the company until investors set it on that day. But some indicators of the valuation include that it was able to raise $5 billion in private funding last year and a current report that puts the valuation at $12 billion. This matches the market for two reasons. One, unlike usual IPOs, institutional investors don't get dibs on shares as they are released publicly all at one time. Number two is the drawback. Why is this stock price is fully in the hands of the public? and Wall Street bets. In other words, the stock can be subject to extreme volatility in the early days of his debut. And that's all we have today for the financial news this week. And now I'll hand it off to Adit for the financial term of the week. Hey guys, in this week's financial term, let's talk about what a PE ratio, also known as a price to earnings ratio, is. So a simple answer to that question is, is that it divides a company's share price by its earnings per share. A P.E. ratio helps investors analyze how much they should pay for a stock on the basis of its current earnings and also shows if the market is overvaluing or undervaluing the company. It helps in predicting future earnings per share through which the investors evaluate what a stock's fair market value should be. Also, companies with no earnings or companies in a loss do not have a P.E. ratio as there is no earnings per share yet. A high P.E. ratio could hint that a stock is overvalued or it just means that investors are expecting high growth rates in the future. There are also two popular types of P-E ratios, known as forward and trailing ratios. A forward P-E ratio uses future earnings stated by companies and other reputable sources to determine its price. The trailing P-E ratio relies on past performance, dividing the current share price by the total EPS earnings over the past 12 months to determine its own price. Overall, the price to earnings ratio is one of the most widely used stock analysis tools used by investors and analysts alike for determining stock valuation. In addition to showing whether a company's stock price is overvalued or undervalued, the P-E ratio can reveal how much a stock's valuation compares to its industry group or benchmark like the S&P 500 index. 
anyways, that pretty much wraps up this week's um, weekly news video. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it and learned something new. And we will see you guys next week. Thanks for watching.